Pat Connie, would you pass these around? A few years ago, my cousin John, who co-authored one of the last books that came out on, on Porter Rockwell, uh, did a little uh, seminar thing, and they met up at Calendar, and it has some of the kind of fun pictures of Porter and the things that he was involved with. And if you just like put, put one on each side of the room and, and they can just kind of thumb through that, that'll show some of the pictures. I'm going to raise this up just a little bit. Is that better? As, as we uh, go along, please please finish your dinner. If, you, if you'd if like to have dessert, I am absolutely not offended. Uh, I think they've, they've kept me in church positions for years because people have been able to sleep very well during my, my speaking. <laughs> Norman Rockwell is the artist. He drew with a brush. Porter Rockwell, he drew with a gun. <laughs> a distinction. They come from the same tree, they're different branches. Uh, both amazing men, very gifted in their, in, in their particular areas. In 1813, <clears throat> in Belcher, Massachusetts, Warren Porter Rockwell was born to his father, whose name was Oren, with one R, and to Sarah Witt Rockwell. They will, in the next few years, move to upstate New York, because the property up there is very inexpensive. It's, it's poor, poor soil. Uh, very little uh, topsoil, lots of trees, lots of rocks. They'll establish their, their home and their farm uh, just outside of Palmyra. A few years later, a family moves in next door, about a mile away. It's the Joseph Smith senior family that moves in. In 1820, Porter Rockwell is seven years old. Joseph Smith Jr. is 14. A lot of people don't recognize that because of the, the unique friendship that develops between Joseph Smith and Porter Rockwell, they felt that they were about the same age, or maybe Porter was a little older. He's actually seven and a half, almost eight years younger than Joseph Smith. The families become very close. In 1820, Joseph has his vision, where he shares that vision of having seen angels, the father and the son, and, and having had the vision and revelation that he received at that time, the Rockwell family knew Joseph Smith. They never doubted him. They will follow the Smith family everywhere they go, literally into the jaws of hell at times. It's interesting to me that, and, and I, I'll give you a little insight into to my feelings as I've studied a lot about Porter and his family over the years, but it's interesting that those that knew Joseph Smith as a young boy, that knew him before he had the vision, they never doubted him. His entire family, his older brothers, they followed him along. They recognized he wasn't a perfect individual, that he had his, his flaws, but he was not untruthful. He and Porter will become uh, very, very close. As a, as a young boy, at eight years old, he would beg his parents to stay up at night to listen to the stories when Joseph would come over with his family and share stories of the, the, the first vision. Uh, they'd let him stay up and keep the fire burning as Joseph would speak. Now, Porter will never learn to read nor write if you ever see his name written, it wasn't him. He wasn't given to those kinds of tedious duties. Uh, he is very gifted in many, many ways, but did not ever take the time to learn to read or write. He may have spent a few days in school, but not many. He worked on the farm. While Joseph is working to get the Book of Mormon translated, Porter is a young teenage boy will be out cutting wood, gathering berries, selling them and giving the money to Joseph to publish the Book of Mormon, a book he'll never be able to read. On April the 6th, 1830, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints will be established, and many of you will remember 
that there are six original members. Following that organization, Joseph will baptize a number of people. The first two people baptized into the church at that time will be his parents. Any guesses who the third is? Warren Porter Rockwell is the third member of the church. When he dies at age 64, he will be the longest, mem the longest living member of the church. Uh, Brigham Young will still be alive for a few more months, but Brigham comes into the picture years later. So, Joseph has followed, uh, Porter has followed Joseph in, in all that he does. He is there all the time. And can you, can you think about that for a minute? Fourteen-year-old Joseph Smith, and here's this seven-year-old tagging along with him. Now, Joseph gets to be 21. Here's Porter. He's a 14-year-old boy. It's an absolutely incredible relationship. The two are devoted to each other, and that will come out as, as time goes along. Porter <clears throat> and his family will follow the saints uh, in... Well, they follow them everywhere they go. They find themselves at the time that Porter's 18 years old in Missouri. They've moved near Independence. Porter has married his childhood sweetheart, Luanna Beebe. Porter's 18 years old. Is 18 years old. Luanna is 17. He buys what he considers his dream farm. He considers himself a, a, a farmer. He's very entrepreneurial. He and his father have opened a business on the Big Blue River just outside of Independence, near, <clears throat> right near the river, and he and his father uh, start a ferry business to get people back and forth across the river. He, uh, he's a quick study. Uh, doesn't worry about reading and writing. Man's word is his bond. I would have liked to have had Porter as my friend. I would not have liked to have him as my enemy. He uh, <clears throat> will build a, a, a nice little log cabin, one of the kind of like what we're talking about, for his wife. He comes home one day, and the mob has come by, has totally terrorized his wife and newborn <coughs> child. They have hooked their ropes to the, the poles on, on the log home and torn it down. They have, They've uh, taken everything that had any value. At that time, Porter's about 21 years old. Uh, he will never go unarmed again and vows that that kind of thing will not happen again. They're driven out of, of Missouri under order of Governor Boggs, which that extermination order lasted about 100 years. And they will move to Nauvoo. Porter uh, is he's in the midst of everything controversial that goes on in the church at that point. He will be the one that kicks in the door of the expositor newspaper that leads to the arrest of Joseph Smith ultimately and has him incarcerated in Carthage. But he is so active with them. He will accompany the prophet and the group that go back to Washington, D.C. to petition the president. President uh, Buchanan on behalf of the saints and those things that have taken place with the extermination order and the way they have been treated and, and everything that is totally against the things that this country stands for and President will tell them your cause is just gentlemen but if I side with you I will lose the entire vote of Missouri our politics haven't changed very much. This isn't the first time we've had challenges. And I believe the Lord will continue to preserve this nation. I hope it, in, in a manner that might be a little easier than I'm afraid it may be. But in any event, he is there <coughs> during, during that, that time. And because of the, the time that he spends with the brethren in the church, now, he will not ascend to a high office in, in church service. But he is always there at the beck and call. He does the difficult work. When Joseph and the brethren are, are incarcerated in liberty, Porter is the one that comes, goes down, and empties the bucket that they have used for a latrine. He takes any of the 
whatever the job is, it doesn't matter how miserable, how nasty, how dirty, he will do it. And he does it with a grateful heart that he has the opportunity to serve Joseph. His wife, who during the, the 10 years that they'll be married, will, will have six children. She gets quite uh, put out with him, tells him, you're going to have to choose between me and not the church really, but the time that you're spending. She wants, he, she wants him to be around home a little bit more, maybe be a better provider because he's always on assignment with the brethren. And you know, the church dogs don't pay much. In fact, I think you pay to serve, don't you? <laughs> so she kind of gives him an ultimatum and, and he tries a little bit, but fails miserably. She's, she's pregnant with their last child at this point. And with all the persecution of the saints, she moves home to be with her parents, who are back in independence. Porter goes back to try and patch things up with Luana, and while he's there, Governor Boggs has an attempt on his life. It was a good attempt. Somebody had a German pepper box pistol, which is really a, a horrible weapon. It shoots buckshot, and they take a shot at him, the dastardly act, through the window while he's playing with his children, shooting through the back of his neck. Some of the balls of that shot end up in his mouth. The guy was too miserable to even die. Well, Porter was in the area. A couple of things, it, 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 nobody knows for sure. But if Porter had shot him, and when he was asked at one time, it's reported that he said, he didn't answer what he shot him, and I said, well, he's still alive, isn't he? And secondly, Porter had his own weapons. This was a stolen weapon that uh, was, was, he wouldn't have used anything like that. It was overloaded, and the individual that committed the act dropped the pistol and ran off. Well, Boggs recovers, becomes the governor of the, of the, the state, and the, earlier, he has tried to put Joseph Smith to death, uh, was only stopped by Alexander Donovan, who was one of his officers and attorney, told him that if he did that, he would hold him, he'd hold him liable before an earthly tribunal, so help him God. So, Joseph and Porter are accused of conspiring and committing the attempted assassination on Governor Boggs. There's a $3,000 bounty put on Porter Rockwell's head. Joseph goes into hiding, actually in Nauvoo. Porter will move back east. He has a very difficult time staying in hiding. He has a very difficult time trying to get a job and, and make a living. He spends the better part of a year in that capacity and then decides he's going to go back and try to get things taken care of with Luana again. He's on his way back. The, uh, the ship that he's on on the Mississippi River, uh, on, on the Missouri River, lands in uh, St. Louis. Unfortunately, the wrong side of the river. And so he is in Missouri. Uh, one of the dissenters from the church recognizes him, uh, Elias Parker, and turns him over to. Uh, a, a sheriff by the name of Fox in St. Louis. If he had landed on the other side of the river, he'd have been safe. They take him into custody <clears throat> without incident. Porter doesn't put up any, any fight. And they're going to take him back to Independence. Now that's clear across the state of Missouri. They leave. This is March. Porter is 29 years old at this point. His wife has six children. She's living with her parents. Difficult, difficult situation. The weather back in that part of the country, if any of you have been there, it's humid, it's cold, it's nasty. It can be horrible. They, they leave, they get him handcuffed, right wrist, down to his left ankle, left wrist, down to his right ankle, with a short chain. He can't stand upright completely. They put him in the stagecoach. They take off in the dark. He has Sheriff Fox with him, a number of other people in the stagecoach, and one of the 
people there is gouging him and bumping him all the time. And you know, Porter finally just has had it. And he says, sir, I don't know who you are, but you're not a gentleman. As they're going along in that kind of weather, the stage driver, he's a little bit cold. And so he's kind of nipping along to warm him up a little bit on the bottle. And he will run the stagecoach into a mud embankment and tip it over on its side. They get out and Porter, along with the other men, will upright the stagecoach and get it back on the road again. They get down the road not more than a mile or two and apparently the driver runs the horses right into a tree, breaks the kingpin on the stagecoach and now they can't, they can't move any further. Porter says, hey, I can fix that. So he gets out, he says, just un unbuckle me and I'll get it done. No, you're not gonna, we're not going to unbuckle you. So with his shackles on, he gets into the boot of the, the stagecoach, gets the tools out, fix the kingpin, gets the things back together. And he says, uh, how are we going to get there? Nobody knows how to drive the stagecoach. Porter says, I can do that. Just unshackle me, I'll drive the stagecoach. They won't do it. He climbs up on the stagecoach and literally drives himself to jail. <laughs> so they get to jail. The, the sheriff there is an, a man by the name of Reynolds. He does not like Porter. He does not like the Mormon people. He's arrested on the attempted assassination of Governor Bob's. They will leave him shackled like that for two weeks. He'll be put in a, a dungeon that he describes as being uh, colder than he can tolerate, that he felt like his teeth were going to sh shake out of his head with the chattering of his teeth and the cold. He was not allowed to buy any charcoal. The only thing he had was what he was wearing and what he describes as urine-soaked straw to sleep on. After two weeks, he is brought before the judge who finds that there is no evidence to hold him. The sheriff will lock him up again for his own protection. He will shackle him back down for the next two weeks. Porter says he's fed rotten meat and corn dodgers, which is cornbread that's so hard if he tries to eat it, it's going to break his teeth. This kind of abuse goes on and on. He finally is allowed to have a, uh, well, there is another prisoner that's brought into the prison, a man by the, the name of Watson. He's a, a, not a forger. Who, who prints money that's not real? A counterfeiter. He's a counterfeiter. He comes in. He has plenty of money, by the way. They'll let him buy his own food, and they'll let him buy some charcoal to keep warm. So one evening, he tells Porter, he says, uh, I'm going to break out of here. You want to come with me? And he says, yeah, I do. So that evening, Watson buys a big dinner. You know, Porter has his little rotten meat and corn dodger. And as the jailer comes in, they pull him into the room, take his keys, they go out, lock him in. As they run down the stairway, Porter sees the jailer's wife and he says, he's fine, he's locked in up there, I threw the key out the window, and they run. Well, Porter gets to the fence, and he, he gets over it easy. Watson ate too much dinner, he can't get over the fence, and hollers for help. Porter makes the, the mistake of going back to help him, and he's captured. Well, they, they bring him back. Now, Sheriff Reynolds is really angry. People have already gathered as a mob. They have a noose. They're going to string him up. Sheriff Reynolds says, just take him. Porter reaches around and grabs a leather pouch full of lead shot, swings around. He says, first man that touches me, I'm going to bust his head. So Reynolds steps in takes him back into custody and shackles him back down. When they bring him in to, before the judge, when they have shackled him initially, the handcuffs on his wrists are so tight they will, they will cut into his flesh. By the time they take him to the judge, he's too weak to stand, and he can move those cuffs up past his elbow and turn him around. The judge uh, uh, will now tell them again that there, is, there are 
There is no evidence to hold him on charges of attempted assassination, but because he has attempted to break out of jail, they're going to keep him. Interesting. Uh, the laws haven't changed very much either. He was, he was being held illegally, and now they're going to keep him because he tried to break out. This will go on back and forth, back and forth, for quite some time. Porter has an unbelievable sense of humor. He's a very, very social man. He loves to be around people. He loves to tell stories. Has a little trouble with dipping the bottle. That'll get worse as time goes on. And he, he, just, he, just, he just loves to be around people. So while he's in the jail, there's a, a Methodist minister who lives across the street there in, in Independence. And he has a, a little Negro daughter that he's adopted. She'll go up and down the street and see Porter there. He waves at her. Pretty soon, they decide that it, it, it was a guy that's really in difficult straits. So they give him a basket and a little uh, whip stock that handled a whip and some twine. And he can take that basket and lower it down. And this little gal will come by and put bread in it. And he brings it up. So he's got a little better something to eat. But what he'll do is he'll take those old corn dodgers, he'll tie them on that string, lay them down, and he'll just dangle them out the window. What are you doing? He says, I'm, I'm fishing for Missouri pukes. <laughs> you caught any? He says, no, nah, but I've had some marvelous nibbles. <laughs> uh, they finally let him have, uh, and this has taken months and months, they'll let him have legal representation. As they give him that opportunity, he chooses a man by the name of Alexander Donovan because he knows that he has defended Joseph Smith in the past. Donovan isn't really a fan of the Mormon people, but he is an honorable and just man. He doesn't want to take the case. The judge says, you don't have any choice. You got it. He will sue for a, a change of venue. He wants the trial moved to liberty. So he goes through all that he needs to do to get Porter moved. They bring Porter in now. It's been months. He has not had a change of clothing. He hasn't shaved. He hasn't cut his hair. He will talk about the vermin that are living in his beard and hair at this point. And he tells the judge, he says, I will die before I will go to liberty without a clean shirt. Somehow they come up with a clean shirt for him. They put him on a horse. They tie his feet under, no saddle, tie his feet under the horse and his hands behind his back and they take off at a gallop. Now those of you who know anything about horses, you know exactly what they were expecting to happen. Well, Porter had learned to be an extremely gifted horseman. They get to liberty. Judge King tells him, get him out of here, the paperwork's wrong. They strap him up the same way, bring him back. Now you can imagine how Sheriff Reynolds feels at this point. Straps him down again, same way. Uh, that goes on now until the first part of December, March to December. Now it's cold, miserable, nasty again. <clears throat> they get him to Liberty. They finally get him before the judge. By the way, no new shirt this time. He's still in that shirt they gave him back at the first time. And Donovan pleads his case before the judge, he says, okay, you have no case, because in Missouri, to break out of jail, you have to break a door, a lock, or a window. They went through an open door, there is no case. The judge says, no, we're not going to play that game, we're having a trial. So they put together a jury, they have a trial that lasts a number of hours. At the end of that, the jury deliberates for a very short period of time. They come in and find Porter Rockwell guilty of breaking jail and sentence him to five minutes. <laughs> Three hours later, Alexander Donovan intervenes because Judge King and Sheriff Reynolds have done everything they can to find something they can hold him on. He tells them that if they don't release him, he'll bring charges against them. So they do release Porter. His mother has come and she has brought $200 that Joseph has raised on his behalf. 
she will take him to the home of a widow lady that she knows in, in Independence. He'll have the first really decent meal that he's had in nine months. Donovan will be there and he says, Porter, you have to get out of town. He says, there are people laying for you everywhere. You cannot leave by the main roads. Porter will give Donovan about $100 of money to pay his fee. He'll give most of the rest of the money back to his mother to get home, telling her that she can't travel with him for the, the danger that would be there. That night he will light out from Independence and go through the fields, avoiding the main roads, in the dark of night and travel 25 miles by foot. He will rest the next day a little bit and then travel another 30 miles by foot. That next night, he will sleep right near Hans Mill. Now that's where he has been driven out of his dream farm, where his family's been torn apart. The carnage that took place there, he's recounting through his life almost 20 years of the abuse that he's received as a member of the church, a follower of Joseph Smith, the way they've been moved, treated, he's lost everything. While he's been in jail, his wife Luanna has divorced him, married a man by the name of Atheus Cutler, and had all his children sealed to him. He's lost everything. Imagine the thoughts that he has at this point. He will spend, this is on the 12th of December that he leaves, he will spend the next 12 days, twice he will stop, once for one day and once for three days, because he will say that he has walked all of the skin off his feet, he can't walk anymore. He'll use some of the money to buy food, he'll use a little bit of the money that he has to rent a horse or a man to carry him. The story about being carried on the back, that's not really true. To carry him, the man took the horse. And they will, he, he will eventually work his way back to Montrose, across the Mississippi River from Nauvoo. It's Christmas Eve. He looks across the river at his beloved Nauvoo. He will use the last of the money he has remaining to hire and uh, pay for the, the ferryman to take him across. He'll immediately go to the mansion house where Joseph has a Christmas party going. Joseph is dressed in his general's uniform for the Missouri Legion. Porter will talk about his resplendent glory. Joseph is a good looking man. He's big, he's strong. Porter's shorter than me. That's not what most of you have in mind. He's strong, he's square, he's, he's built. And he is not a handsome man. You know, it looks like Mutt and Jeff when he and Joseph together. The only thing they really had in common, they both limped. You know about the operation that Joseph had? Well, Porter broke his leg and it was set incorrectly, and so it was shorter. So the two of them always limped. Joseph gave him a beautiful cane that was, Porter didn't use it very much, but it was prized possession. But he will go to the mansion house. He sees what's going on there. He and Joseph, they have always been jokers. Joseph got in trouble for that more than once. And he thinks, here, I've got this great opportunity. So he shows up at the door, beats on the door. One of the, the guards comes to the door and he tries to break his way in and tussle in with this young man. Joseph, sitting at dinner, hears the commotion. And it's basically not in my house. Joseph gets up, goes to the door, grabs this dirty, filthy thing he hasn't cut his hair, he hasn't bathed. He's been on middle of December, he's been in the backwoods traveling, and he grabs him, he's gonna chuck him right out the door and looks into the steel gray eyes and recognizes his friend, Porter Rockwell. Takes that dirty man and just embraces him, tears flow. He shortens the evening with dinner. I don't know if they invited Porter in. I kind of doubt that. I think he would, Porter wouldn't have come in there. But he has him wait, and after the guests have left, <coughs> Joseph and some of, a few of the guests remain. Uh, they will go into the parlor room, and Porter will recount what has taken place. 
in independence and during the time he was incarcerated. And Joseph is so grateful because while Porter's been incarcerated, a lot of the pressures on the saints has been taken off. In the midst of this discussion, uh, one, of the, one of the couples that were there will recount in their journal that Joseph is speaking and he will stop and turn and look into Porter's eyes and then say words similar to the following. I prophesy in the name of Messiah that if you are in Porter Rockwell will remain true and faithful. You need fear no enemy. Cut not thy hair and bullet nor blade shall harm thee. Now Porter considered that a blessing. It was a prophecy and he believed it to his inner core. Uh, I, I don't know that he was ever really terrified of any of the assignments he had. But he did make efforts at one point to get away from the young guns that were trying him, who had heard the legend and figured they could take him down. And unfortunately, there were more than one of these young men that lost their lives in those encounters. He'll actually go to California, change his name for a while, and, and just try to, to avoid them. Well, Joseph realized that Porter has nothing. And so during the next little while there, he tells Porter, he says, you know, you're a pretty good bartender. And you know, we've got the mansion house here. We have guests coming all the time. Why don't you set up a bar here and that'll allow you to make a, 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 a living, make a little money? Porter says, good idea. Well, Emma had gone for an extended visit with her parents. Now, when Emma, Emma came, sisters, what did Emma do? She walks in her home, the mansion house, looks in there, there's Porter smiling. Now, his hair was already long, and, and I'm sure he washed it by then, but he's already raggedy looking. She recognizes him. Hi, Emma. Hi, Porter, where's Joseph? <laughs> Joseph Smith the third, Joseph Smith's oldest son, will recount that this was the only argument he ever heard his parents have. Any guesses as to who won that argument? <laughs> Joseph comes out and says, hey, Porter, and Porter says, hey, I got it. <laughs> he moves the bar out the next day. It's gone. Uh, Joseph, I think, still looking at how can I help Porter, will uh, assign him the responsibility of being his bodyguard. Now there are a number of people who are going to be bodyguards for Joseph Smith and Brigham Young. Porter will be one of them from this time on. Shortly thereafter, the, cha the challenges with the saints have gotten so bad that in the middle of the night, Joseph and Hiram will come to Porter's home and say, we need you to take us across the river. We're leaving. So they will, they will, uh, Right then, he just up goes, they, they get in a, a rowboat, a porter will roam across the river. As they get to the other side, and they sit down, they say, you know, we're going to need horses. So porter will go back by himself to get the horses, and Joseph sends a letter back to Emma. The idea for Joseph and Hiram is if they leave, and start to go west, then the persecution will will stop. The, 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 those who are inflicting that on the saints will recognize they're, they're leaving, we can leave them alone. Well, as he, as, as he goes, he takes the letter to Emma. Emma writes a letter back to Joseph. She's distraught. She doesn't want him to leave. They'll also bring back a uh, Uh, another man, and I can't remember his name right now. My age is catching up with me. Yeah, he'll come back with them. And as they get there, he gives Joseph the letter from Emma. And then the individual that comes back with, with him tells Joseph, he says, you promised us that if we stuck with you, you'd stick with us, and now you get a little bit of problems and you run away. And Joseph will, will utter those words that we, we've heard. If my life is of no importance to my friends, then it's of no importance to me. As they discuss it, Hiram says, let's, let's go back. 
the Lord's hand will be in it. This is, this is around the 20, mid-June, mid 1844. As they start to go back, Joseph is, is moving very slowly. He drops to the back, and he and Porter are talking. He turns to Porter, and he says, Porter, what should I do? What, what do I do? And Porter just looks at him. He says, Joseph, you're the oldest. You make your bed, and I'll lie in it with you, telling him whatever you do, I'm with you, I'm, I'll support you. He tells Porter, he says, when I get back, he says, I want to I want to talk to the saints one more time by the new client. Would you rally the saints? So they get back, it's it's night time. As they come up towards the mansion house, Emma and the family come out. Joseph's heart just melts. He says, Porter, never mind, I'm going to spend this evening with my family. The next day he and Hiram and uh, their small entourage will leave to turn themselves in to the authorities in Carthage. We know those things that will transpire to the next little while. Governor Forbes, Forbes, Governor Ford, my doctor is Dr. Forbes. Uh, Governor Ford comes to uh, Nauvoo and he will be there to make sure that there isn't a big uprising. There's a meeting that goes on. As they leave the meeting, Porter walks out and forgets his hat. As he gets out, he realizes he's left it. He comes back in. As he comes back in, he hears Governor Ford turn to some of the colleagues there. And this is, this is on the 27th of June. And his words are, by now the deed is done. Porter excuses himself, picks up the habit, and he starts to think about what was just said. Now, Porter's been told three times by the prophet, do not come to Carthage under any circumstance. You're not to come. Porter, did you hear me? You are not to come to Carthage under any circumstance. And then he's left that message with a number of people that Porter is not to come to Carthage. Well, weeks have gone by, and... After hearing those words, Porter just he mounts the horse and he's headed for Carthage. He's halfway there when he meets a rider coming back who informs him that Joseph has been murdered. Porter will turn around and ride through the streets of Nauvoo, yelling to the saints that they've killed him, they've killed him. The church is in the church is in disarray. Uh, Porter, you know, the string was he has, he has followed all of the rules. He's tried to stay by Joseph, but this is the last straw. He's not married. He doesn't have a family anymore. And so for the next 10 years, he fills that role. He'll be made a, a, a marshal. He will be at the crossroads uh, just outside of Nauvoo when Sheriff Bacantos rides in in his wagon. The mobs have, have just gone crazy. There have been 45 homes burned. Some of them belong to the saints, some of them belong to others. But everything that's happening is not being blamed on the mob. The people that are doing it is being blamed on the Mormons. It's retaliation for the prophet's death. Well, Bacchantos is trying to keep the peace, and all of a sudden, some of the mob's after him. He rides down the road. He pulls the wagon to a stop in front of Porter, and a man by the name of Redding at the crossroads there. He says, in the name of the state of Illinois, I command you to defend me. And he deputizes them. And here this group comes over the top of the hill. Back and toes orders them to stop. They fire. And he, he tells them, shoot them. Porter levels off and fires. And he says, I got him, I got him. <laughs> well, he shot Frank Whirl. Frank Whirl. So I aim for his belt buckle and I hit it. But he flies off the horse, he's on the ground, dying, as they gather him up and, and take him off. But Whirl was the head of the Carthage Grays, the one that when the mob came for Joseph, fired their guns in the air and allowed the mob to come in and take him. Porter felt somewhat vindicated. He had, he had pledged that he would get revenge for Joseph's death. Uh, a little later as the saints are leaving, they're on the plains of Iowa. 
They have put a reward for Porter's capture at $2,000. And so the saints are being harassed out on the plains as they, as, they, as they have left Nauvoo because of all of the people that are looking to gain the reward. They will, Brigham Young will actually call Porter in and say, you know, would you go back and turn yourself in and let's get these crazies out of here. He says, I don't know what will happen to you. Or he says, oh, I'll do it. So he went back and made a real scene. He made a huge scene. Barricaded himself in, shot things up in the streets. And then he will surrender himself to Sheriff Bacintos. Now remember, he's the one that deputized him. They'll incarcerate him, they'll incarcerate him for four months. Now this time he doesn't mind being incarcerated because the saints are out on the plains. This is why Porter didn't go with the uh, Mormon battalion. He's in jail when they leave. They will finally bring it to, to court. Bacintos is the one that brought him in. Guess who gets the reward? Bacintos. Uh, they'll bring the, uh, the hearing before the judge. Bacintos says, yeah, I ordered him to shoot. They shot first. He's deputized. So they dropped all the charges. Interestingly, from that point on, Porter never seems to have any financial problems. We suspect that the reward got split. So Porter takes off with uh, probably a $1,000 uh, head start. He will work as a guide. He will shoot buffaloes. In fact, he tries. To, they tell him he can't kill a buffalo by shooting it in the head. You know, I'm, I'm a dentist by profession, and and Porter at one point will will tell uh, Judge Judge uh, Drummond he's making some terrible comments about Porter. And Porter happens to be in the, the courtroom, and he'll say, "Now, Judge, you know, I never killed a man that didn't need killing. Well, I never drilled a man that didn't need drilling. So we <laughs> sounded like a drill. But anyway." Porter will will take that bet that you can't kill a buffalo by shooting it in the head. And by the way, with those guns back then, you couldn't. But he'll ride up right along one of those big bulls and put the gun right down by its head and shoot it. And just piles up the dust. Now that the, it makes him mad enough, he chases Porter back to camp. Basically, as he gets close to camp, somebody's rifle will shoot the buffalo. Porter's answer to that is, yeah, I just didn't want you to have to travel out so far to get skimmed. <laughs> but here this man that thought himself to be a farmer will probably never actually farm again. He's very entrepreneurial. As he gets into the valley, Joe, uh, Brigham, actually Porter, will scout out the actual route into the valley. And Brigham will assign him to get the timber that is needed immediately to find the best places to irrigate and plant crops and where the seeds should be planted. And then he'll immediately send him back on the trail back and forth. He'll be the one that's sent almost immediately to go to San Diego to bring back the, uh, the members of the battalion. He actually does that. It's really an interesting story because he, he goes down and the man who he's assigned to go with, a man by the name of Jefferson Hunt, uh, says, hey, I can get this, we'll go get these cows. He takes them down. They almost die on the way after three of their horses. They get down to the Chino Ranch and it takes about six weeks for the men to recover and he's ready to go back. He has 200 handed of cattle and 40 bulls. Jefferson's going to take them back and Porter says, well, I got a letter from Brigham for the, the battalion members. And he says, no, we're going back. He says, this has been too hard of a trip, we're going back. Porter says, I'm not going with you, that's a suicide mission. So he leaves them. He goes on down to San Diego, finds the, the battalion. He gets, uh, I think, 140 head of mules. He brings 50 battalion members, all of the mules and the wagons back. All of them, they come back in seven weeks. Now, Hunt, on the other hand, takes him 14 weeks. He loses 100 head of the cattle, half of them, and all but one of the bulls. Porter comes into Salt Lake about the same time that Hunt gets there. Hunt is just outraged because he was in charge. He goes to the High Council and uh, accuses Porter of desertion. 
So they bring that before the High Council after they, they consider it, they exonerate Porter again. So he continues to move forward. He's, he's, uh, he's made a deputy marshal. He will be called as a missionary to the Indians, which he will keep that position for the rest of his life. He's 36 years old. He'll be put with George Bean, who is a young man, 18 years old, is called as a missionary to the Indians. And again, it's another Mutton Jeff. George Bean is this great big kid, big strong guy. Little old Porter goes with him. Bean won't carry a gun. Porter's, if he's in his wagon, he's got two 15 shot repeaters, plenty of ammunition, pistols in both coat pockets, and probably knives in his boots. So Bean goes in, talks to the Indians, and Porter says, I'll stick out here and I'll cover you. <laughs> so they, they have such a unique relationship. Porter's now 40 years old. He's doing business with uh, John Neff, who owns a, owns a sawmill up in Sawmill Canyon. While he's doing business with him, he'll meet Marianne, his 22-year-old daughter, and they fall in love. Now, Marianne's an amazing girl. She has known Porter from the time she was little. You know, this wild and woolly guy knows. You know, he loved and cursed at the same time by many of the saints. I, I uh, did one of these a, a number of years ago for Sister Dunn, Lauren, Lauren Dunn's widow. And at the end, we had a little question answer period, and one of the sisters says, you've just spent an hour telling us what a wonderful man Porter Rockwell was. I was raised to believe that he was such a scoundrel. How do you account for that? And I said, I, you know, I guess it depends on whether he defended your grandpa or shot him. <laughs> <laughs> But he was a controversial man throughout his life. Uh, he had a gift to heal. He would give blessings, and he was called upon many times to go in in that capacity. He actually officiated in the uh, endowment house at one time. His temple work has been done a myriad of times. The truth was, he was endowed and sealed all while he was alive. He held the office of an elder in the church. He wasn't very churchy. He made it to a few meetings on occasion. He had a gift from Joseph Smith that was a leather-bound Book of Mormon. I have a replica of that given to me by a, a, a good friend. He treasured it. Couldn't read it, but he treasured it. It was a gift from Joseph. He believed every word that Joseph said. He knew that he knew the men that were loyal to Joseph. He loved the Smith family. The only time in his life he will cut his hair. The only time he cuts his hair after the pronunciation of what he considered a blessing was when he went to California and he ran into Agnes Smith in San Francisco who was the widow of Don Carlos Smith, Joseph's brother. She'd had uh, typhoid fever and lost all of her hair. He felt so badly for her, he went out and had his hair cut. Had a wig made for her, presented it to her, and then he went into hiding. Because he feared for his safety and well-being, having cut his hair. He'll change his name to Brown. Uh, he'll try his hand at panning gold during that time. And after a day working in the mine, pick and shovel, he goes down to the camp get a drink, finds out what it costs for a shot of whiskey, he will open three ends and bars, bars and ends, and he'll start panning the miners rather than panning for gold, and he does very, very well. Uh, he's accompanied uh, one of the general authorities back there to try to get the tithing from Sam Brannan, who has actually become apostate, and uh, Brannan will tell them, give me a, a note from God and I'll give you the money. Uh, uh, inter interesting thing that takes place there. The Porter's daughter, they think, has been kidnapped. He finds him with a man by the name of Gates. She leaves Salt Lake, runs away. This is one of his daughters with his first wife. And she is married to him at age 16. In 18 months, he will die. He's a very, very wealthy man, Gates. She becomes an extremely wealthy widow. She'll eventually come back to Utah and take care of her mother. But that's an interesting story because the Green descendants of the, the Gates family, as we served in San Diego on our mission, 
our director's wife is a descendant of that man. And they've always been told that Porter shot him because he married his daughter. Well, he did get shot, but apparently it wasn't Porter. So the daughter comes back, they're on good terms, but uh, just a lot of things happened while he was in California. He finally has to leave because they have a shooting contest at one of his bars. A man by the name of uh, Stewart is bragging on what a great shot he is. So they have the contest going and, and Porter just can't stand it because he's he really is a good shot. He's just gifted with any kind of firearm. So he enters the contest and he, he beats this guy. The guy looks at him and he says, there's only one man alive that can outshoot me and that's Porter Rockwell and you're him. So the next day he just ups and leaves. He gets back to Salt Lake. He marries Marianne Neff. They, he has had six children with his first wife. He and Marianne during the next 12 years will have seven children. This wonderful woman will adopt two orphaned Indian children to raise as her own, and, and, and then a couple of strays that Porter brings home, young men that are struggling. She will die in childbirth with, with their last child. Porter will be alone, hires a, a woman to be a housekeeper and tend his children, Christina Olson. She is a Norwegian descent and doesn't speak much English. And she becomes and I come from the second wife, Marianne Neff, uh, because the children are there. Imagine that many children. You've got a housekeeper taking care of you, and she's going to do the discipline because Dad's always gone. They considered her the evil stepmother. And so the stories about her weren't very good in the family. In a fit of rage one night, she destroyed everything that had anything to do with Marianne. The one picture that you see of Marianne, that's the only one they can find of her. Everything else was destroyed. Well, after, after four years, she tells Porter, she said, I'm going to have to leave. I'm not getting any younger, and I've got to find me a husband. And he basically says, well, I'll, I'll marry you. And so he marries again. <laughs> and unfortunately, I think she felt that was the reason he married her. They will have four children. Uh, and we're going to move along really quick. There's a lot of shoot 'em up stories. Some of them are true and some are not. Uh, the story of Oates who is one of those young men who decides he has heard the story of Porter. He meets Porter on a road, coming home, Porter's in the wagon. He tells, he, he says, you, you, you Porter Rock, and they stop. It's not like we drive past each other now. They stop and, hey, how are you, where are you going? They have a little conversation. He says, you Porter Rock, well, aren't you? And he goes, yeah. Well, this kid brings a gun up over the saddle bar and just has it right on him. And he says, uh, well, they tell me you can't be killed, but I'm here to prove them different. Porter just looks at him and shakes his head and he says, you can't kill a man without a cap on your gun. The kid looks down and at that time, Porter, if Porter had his hands in his pockets, you were in trouble. He just blows out the front of his coat and the kid falls dead. That either happened at this point of the mountain or out in Vernon. Stories vary. I had a chance to visit with uh, Sherman Fleet, who is the uh, historian, military historian, who's at uh, West Point. He is the expert and has written the books all on the Mormon Battalion. And as we talked the one day, I'd done one of these there, and he said, I would touch his story with a 10 foot pole. Because of, he says, you don't know what's true and what's not. He says, <laughs> he says there's so much embellishment to the good end and to the bad end, you can't sort it out. He said, I'm not going to write without a lot of solid, solid evidence. So you're going to hear a lot of stories. There's a lot of different endings. Some of them are true, some of them are not. The reports around and, and the, the dime novels that have been written that include Porter Rockwell, Brigham Young, and, and the Mormon people, there are probably 200 of them. Those are the things that inflamed the East and the lies that came back. Johnston's army was actually Harney's army to begin with, who committed terrible acts against the Indians and got the Indians in an uproar. And when Buchanan sent what became Johnston's army out, sent them to exterminate Brigham Young and Porter Rockwell and put down the Mormon Rebellion, that was their orders. Porter finds out about it, 
as he's taking care of one of the mail contracts he has. He's out in the very western part of Nebraska when he finds out, turns around and rides 600 miles in five days back to Salt Lake. Can't find any of the saints are all up having a 4th of July celebration in the canyon. It's been 10 years. And Brigham says, well, the devil's taken me at my word. He'd make the comment that if you give us 10 years of peace here, heaven and hell won't move us. And here it was, 10 years. So Porter has now, he, he has holdings in all over Salt Lake. He owns the, the Colorado livery. He owns the contract for the, the mail service. He's, he's got mining contracts. He's got lumber contracts. He owns the brewery. He makes mountain tan. He doesn't do the work himself. He owns a whole bunch of, of halfway houses where you can restaurants, bars, a few rooms to rent. Uh, you name it, horses, cows, sheep, pigs, he's, he's just gifted with all of those kinds of things and then he's busy with the church. He's one of the wealthiest men in the state. It's the 8th of June, 1878. Porter's in Salt Lake City. He will take his daughter to the theater. He loves the theater. He actually performs at one time. He's a terrible actor, but he actually performs. And they have a, a wonderful night at the theater. He takes her home for safety, and then he'll come back to one of the local bars, as he typically does in the evening. And he buys a round of drinks for the boys, as he refers to everyone who's at the bar when he's there. And you have the choice, you can drink with him or you can leave. After a few drinks and a few good stories, he goes back to the Colorado livery, his, his uh, man who manages that is there. Porter has a little room that he has a bed in there. He's got places to sleep in Skull Valley and you name it. He's got little places everywhere. He's not feeling well. He lays down. He, he tells him, so I'm not feeling well. I got to get some sleep. Uh, immediately he's back up with just with fits of nausea and vomiting. And he lays down again midway through the evening. He will get up, put his boots on, and then he'll fall back on the bed dead. There'll be a coroner's inquest. They'll have two coroners examine him because of all of the stories about his not being able to be killed by a bullet or a knife. The conclusion is he's died from heart stoppage. He has had a massive heart attack. A few days later, they will have his funeral. At that funeral, Joseph F. Smith will eulogize him in words that will inflame the non-Mormon members of the community. As reported in the Tribune, they'll say, Joe made the following comments. And he will say, yesterday, Warren Porter Walkwell was ushered into heaven with all of the glory due uh, a saint of God. Porter Rockwell has gone to heaven and apostates are going to hell. And then he'll go on with a few other comments. At the end of the article that has quoted Joseph F. Smith, it'll say, and this is a fitting tribute of one lawbreaker for another. So Porter Rockwell's legacy is one that is absolutely amazing, just as many of you have with those early pioneers, early saints, early people that have done things. This is a unique story because of all the publicity. There, there are articles that are accusing him of murder in California, Utah, and back east all at the same time. Anything they couldn't come up with, somebody they blamed it on Porter, the Danites, the Avenging Angels, all of, all of those kinds of things. So he's the center of controversy. Whether he shot your grandpa or saved him, probably will dictate how people hold him. He's become a little bit like Robin Hood. He's, he was never an outlaw, never was, was accused, well, never was convicted of a wanton killing. Never, it was always a face you down in the street or, you know, come in, you know, if he's bringing in a criminal, it was come along peacefully or come along dead. So uh, yeah, I, I find that he is a man we, we talk about men for all seasons. Well, 
Porter was a man for a very specific season, for a specific purpose. And with all of the things that he did, he was a phenomenal judge of character. He had, he had a passion for justice. He had seen so much injustice that that wasn't going to happen under his watch. Didn't matter if you were a member of the church, you were not a member of the church, man, woman. If you were good, he took care of you. If you weren't, he addressed you. He brought in many, many more people alive than he did dead. If you read all of the goofy literature, it would be over 200 people. It's probably more in the line of 20, 24. But the, the records are so, so challenging, nobody knows for sure. But in the end, he exhibited the ultimate faith. He never did really like Brigham Young and the other brother and all that much. But he had the greatest respect. He had faith in them. But he will make that comment that Joseph Smith was my only true friend. Well, I appreciate the opportunity to be here with you tonight. This, this is something about Porter that could go on a long, long time. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm proud of the heritage that I have. Uh, as, as when Porter died, because all of his contracts were verbal, it was an absolute nightmare for his widow. Uh, she lost almost everything. A lot of the people that had been so honorable when Porter was alive were not honorable at the end. Uh, the children, she was very, very religious. The children took issue with her on a lot of things, and our generation is the first generation back in the church. Most of the, the Rockwell family went uh, in totally inactive. Uh, the, his first wife's children were, most of them joined the reorganized church. Eventually, his wife does come back to the church. And uh, sorry that I have not taken the time to research uh, Christina Olson's children to know just what has happened with their families. But he ended up with about uh, 19 descendants, and uh, not many of them stayed at the church, but that has really come back around. I might share one other thing just quickly with you. When I was going to school in Nebraska, I got up one Saturday morning, I looked out the window, here's my home teacher out there just shoveling my path out like crazy. And I went out and I said, Jim, what are you doing? He says, I'm just trying to make up for what my grandfather did to yours. I said, what are you talking about? He says, well, my great-grandfather was Sheriff Reynolds. <laughs> the Lord has a way of bringing things full circle. So I you know, bless, you, bless you for what you do, for the, the heritage you, that you have and what, what you live. And thank you so much for the opportunity to be with you here this evening. Now, do you, do you have any questions I might answer? How old was he when he finally died? He was just a few weeks short of 65. Uh, until my father came along, he was the oldest living member of the family. Uh, most of the men have died either with uh, what appears to be rheumatic heart fever or alcoholism. Major problem in the Rockwell family. Are there any books you would recommend? Yes, there are a lot of books about Porter. Some of those old dime novels you want to get away from, Holy Murder and, and The Avenging Angel and some of those, they, they are they're totally fictional. The only thing that has anything to do with anything is the names, Brigham Young, Joseph Smith, Porter Rockwell. The, the first one that was done that has any substance to it was written by uh, Van Alphen. It was part of his doctorate work down at BYU. And then, uh, oh, Schindler. Schindler. Schindler wrote the book, uh, Man of God, Son of Thunder. That is a very good work. The next one that came out was written by Dewey, and that is a biography, and he did a lot of research. The problem is a lot of the research, we don't know if it's true or not, because they're from journals and, and memories and, and so forth. So he did that. That is probably the very best one. That will put it together and show you what is going on with the, with, with the, the church and the movement and how Porter interfaces with it. It is, it is really fascinating. You know, the, the story of Porter is that thick in the research. And 
how that's going on about that thick. Uh, he, he did that, and then the last one came out, uh, Deseret Book commissioned my cousin John to uh, co-write a book, and it's basically the stories. Uh, these quick stories, the shoot 'em ups and so forth, and, and that, that's a fun read. But probably the, the most definitive one is, is uh, uh, Dewey's uh, the biography. Big book, it's still, it's still in print, you might have to ask him for it. And then uh, there are a couple of novels that have been written. Nelson did that with uh, Storm Testaments. And then uh, Dewey came out with, with his own novel, because he had done so well with the biography. I, I think he did that. But the novels really confused us, because they, they write in the story with some of the details they have. But I would, I would recommend that. There's the fun stories John has done, and there's a tape, uh, CD with it. And then Dewey's work is, is the best one. Oh yeah, they did that. Uh, uh, Carl Malone was in that. Yeah. Yeah, there. There was a little bit to that because there was a man named Porter Rockwell, but other than that, <laughs> they've they've done a couple of things on Porter Rockwell. None of them are very complimentary to him nor the church. After he was kicked out of the Malibu House, I think uh, he ran in a partnership with Joseph in a tavern. Was something like that. Oh yeah, he opened another bar. Right. Yeah, you got to remember this was before the Word of Wisdom had been brought as a commandment. commandment. But his interface with the less than desirables provided a lot of information to protect the saints. I mean, he, he knew that what slime was coming down the road. Absolutely, he did that, and he was very at home in high places, low places. He just he was that jovial guy that just hey, let's have a good time. You know, he was, he was a good time guy, and uh, he, he, he was, the, the, the children just loved him. He, the, 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 his children, grandchildren, when he was around, they just absolutely adored him. And he was the one that many people sent for when they needed a blessing for the sick. So, uh, you know, he, he administered a little lead poisoning here and there, but on the other hand, what, what do you do? <laughs> Without a few people like him, the, the saints would have been overrun. Once he said, uh, I never killed a man, did he kill Yeah, that was, in, that was in a court setting with W.W. Uh, w. Drummond, who was the secretary of, of the Utah Territory, who was an extremely corrupt man. But he, did, he had made the comment in court that there was something going on, and he, so Porter Rockwell did that, and he made some comment about he's a no good, lousy murderer. Porter happened to be in the back and he hadn't recognized he was there. He was generally drunk on the stand and had a prostitute that accompanied him. It's quite a, a colorful time in Utah history. Well, again, this it's fun and it, you know the history is just it's just amazing. And if you want something that's just a light, easy read, well, they're all fun, easy reads. Just remember to take it with a grain of salt. I've had people. We've all got the same the same story, but the sources we've got it from are a little different. Uh, many of the, the legends that have been passed down in the family, I know they are embellished beyond belief. <laughs> but that's what happens to colorful characters. So I'll look forward to someday in the hereafter to be able to sit down with him. And you know, I think he liked the notoriety because he would never come out and actually say, yes, I did or no, I didn't, when people would ask him, whether it's Boggs or these other things. He, would, he just would leave it. Just leave it up in the air. <laughs> well, thank you again. It's just a privilege to be with you. I appreciate the, the work that you're doing and carrying on the heritage of, 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 of our wonderful forefathers. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mike.